Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're going to tackle a client that has a fracture to their skull. Specifically, I want to talk about basilar skull fractures because they tend to come up on exams and the NCLEX. So let's jump into that practice question to get things started. The nurse is caring for a client with a basal or skull fracture, which assessment findings require immediate follow-up. We have A, periorbital ecchymosis, B, retroauricular or mastoid ecchymosis, C, a temp of 100.9 Fahrenheit, and that is 38.3 Celsius, or D, a headache. So we're looking for the assessment finding that requires immediate follow-up. Think that through, tuck the answer away for later, and we will circle back to it at the end. First, we're going to jump into all about these basal or skull fractures. These are not just your everyday bump on the head. It's a break that happens at the very base of the skull. And that is a big deal because of all the critical structures we have down there. So base of the skull has several bones. And honestly, you don't need to know all of the names, the ethnoid, the sphenoid, the temporal. You learned all that back in anatomy. But what's important is that all the bones down there at the base form the floor of the cranial vault. So these are thinner and fragile bones, at least compared to the rest of the skull, and basically are the barrier between things like the brainstem, cranial nerves, sinuses. That's key right there, sinuses. So if we fracture the base of the skull, it's not just about the bone itself. It's about everything it can lead to. It can open up that cranial vault and we've got a direct line between the outside world and the brain. Obviously a big issue. Now, one of the most important areas is the cribiform plate. Now, again, I really don't care if you remember the name of that, but what I want you to know is that that area, that part of the skull, forms the roof of the nasal cavity and the floor of the cranial vault. Okay, so connecting sinuses up in the nose to the brain. And in a basilar skull fracture, this delicate bone can crack and we've got a passageway between the nose and the brain. Okay, we're going to see that trickle out into some of our signs and symptoms and the things we have to monitor for. So what do we actually see? Hallmark signs are bruising in very specific locations. First is periorbital ecchymosis. So that's bruising around the eyes, often called raccoon eyes. Then we have battle sign. This is retroauricular. So auricles are our ears, retro behind. Retroauricular ecchymosis is bruising behind the ears over that mastoid bone right here, okay? That is called battle sign. So raccoon eyes, battle sign, those are the two bruise type signs you're gonna be looking for. The next thing you're gonna look for is a CSF leak out of the nose. So if we've damaged that cribiform plate, we've got an opening between that cranial vault and the sinuses, CSF can be leaking out of the nose. So we will have clear nasal discharge. And then to check that that is CSF, we will do the halo sign where we drop that CSF on a white piece of paper and look for a ring around the outside. That is going to tell us, oh my gosh, we don't just have like a regular head injury. We have a fracture that has opened the door to the brain, quite literally, and CSF is coming out the nose. Now, I have seen a basal or skull fracture two times during the years that I worked in the emergency department. Both were sports-related injuries. One, I had a 16-year-old that came in after a hockey game. And then the other one was an older gentleman, a father who had been hit on the back of his head with a golf club, all right? So high velocity injuries to the back of the head, that is what we're gonna be looking out for that are the most likely ways to cause a basal or skull fracture. So I'm gonna jump into the story of the 16 year old. Again, he came into the ED after a hockey game. What had happened was he bent down to tie his skates and you know, he's popping back up a teammate took a shot from center ice. He didn't have his helmet on yet because he's just tying his laces. And that puck went right square in the back of the head. So 
He passed out on scene, but woke up. EMS brought him in and like he was a little dazed, a little pale. He said, my head is pounding. No surprise there. He's a little nauseous. He vomits right as we're getting him off the stretcher and into the triage room. But he's alert, right? Like he's there. He's telling us what happened. He remembered the incident, which is typically a good sign for our neuro status. So now going through the rest of his exam, I, you know, got a basilar skull fracture on my radar since he took a hockey puck right to the back of his head, but I don't see the classic signs yet. There's no periorbital ecchymosis or raccoon eyes. There's no bruising behind his ear, that battle sign. I don't see any fluid dripping out of his nose. But when I look at his eyes, his pupils definitely looked slightly off. He had one pupil at about three millimeters and the other almost double that at about five to six. And they were sluggishly reactive. So I definitely don't like when I see pupils of different sizes. And remember, we always want them to react very briskly. Okay. He also told me that he's hearing like a ringing in his ear and that he everything sounds muffled to him. So I'm now worried like, okay. We already have some oculomotor dysfunction. That's cranial nerves three and six, right? And then the ringing in the ear, I'm thinking about cranial nerve eight. All of these cranial nerves really close right there to the brainstem where we can have that basal or skull fracture. So even though I don't see the bruising yet, those things are already kind of raising my red flag. So before we did anything else, pretty much right once he got to triage and we were like, yeah, he's stable, his vitals are signed, he's not crashing right now, CT. We want to see what this fracture is or if there's even a fracture, where it is, because that is going to help us really know how to treat it. One of the biggest things we want to find out if it is a basal or skull fracture is making sure we take the precaution of nothing going in to their nose. So I'm not dropping an NG tube. I'm not doing nasal suctioning. I'm not sticking anything in there because remember, we could have a direct opening into the brain. And if we just blindly go like shoving an NG tube in there, it could go right into the intracranial space. Rare, but fatal, right? So key takeaway, if you suspect a basal or skull fracture, obviously you're going to get imaging, but hold off on anything going in to the nose. That's going to be a key nursing takeaway. I see that pop up on the NCLEX all the time when it comes to those basal or skull fractures. So this kiddo went to CT. He definitely had a basal or skull fracture. By the time he got back, we were starting to see battle sign. There was some bruising, the beginning signs of it, and he had CSF leaking out of his nose. We had clear nasal drainage. I dropped some of it on a sheet of paper. We saw halo sign. So all of that clinically and the imaging put the puzzle pieces together. Now, at that point, we got him up to the floor. He's not crashing in the ED. But when I followed up with the nurse the next day, if you know me by now, I like to, you know, wander around, go up to the floor and check on people. Not everybody, but sometimes, you know. And he had a fever, 100.9. So not like dramatic or anything. You most of the time wouldn't panic at that number. But because of the basal or skull fracture and seeing that CSF leak, red flag for meningitis. The nurse in med surge, Drew Cultures, started empiric antibiotics. I believe it was Ceph and Vank, and they consulted neurosurgery. So he actually ended up going into the PICU from the floor so he could have those closer neuro checks, knowing that meningitis was definitely a possible complication and we wanted to really prevent that. And in this case, the empiric antibiotics did the trick. His fever never spiked higher than that. He was on Q2 neuro checks in the PICU, I believe just for a couple of days before he went back down to step down and was discharged about a week later. He wasn't able to go to hockey for several months while everything healed, but ultimately he made a full recovery. And the bottom line I want you as the nurse to remember is what are those key signs? Hey, it's a high velocity injury to the back of the head. I'm looking for that bruising around the eyes, that bruising behind the ears, that CSF leaking out the nose. 
And if I have any of those suspicions, I am going to make sure to take the safety precaution of not putting anything in the nose. Suction and G2 meds, nothing. Don't put anything in the nose, full stop. That could be opening up to the brain. Okay, that's your key takeaway here. With that being said, let's circle back to our practice question and wrap this episode up with the answer. So remember, you're caring for a client with a basal or skull fracture, which assessment findings require immediate follow-up. We had A, the periorbital ecchymosis, B, the retroauricular mastoid ecchymosis, C, the temp of 100.9, and D, the headache. So which of those findings require immediate follow-up? Follow up. And on the end clicks, you're going to see that keyword immediate in bold. That's telling you this is a prioritization question. So, all four of these symptoms, they're things that we absolutely could see with a basal or skull fracture, but only one of them jumps out as an unexpected finding. Remember, we prioritize unexpected over expected. A, the periorbital ecchymosis, that's our raccoon eyes. We expect to see that. B, the retroauricular or mastoid ecchymosis, that's the bruising behind or under the ear here by that mastoid bone. That's battle sign. Again, an expected finding of a basal or skull fracture. And then D, a headache. That is absolutely expected. It would not require follow-up. A, B, and D are things that, yeah, I don't like that it's happening, but they are consistent with the injury and they don't raise my red flag. What's unexpected is, is C, the temp of 100.9. Just like in our case, we had that 16-year-old hockey puck to the back of his head. He had all these signs. He actually didn't get raccoon eyes very badly, but he definitely had the battle sign and he definitely had a pounding headache. When his temp went up, though, that prompted the nurse on the floor to raise the red flag. They got cultures. They started empiric antibiotics. He ended up going to the PICU for really close neuro checks. Because remember, when you have a basal or skull fracture, meningitis is a big complication we're worried about due to the direct communication of that CSF with the nasal passage. We can have that rhinorrhea, where we see that CSF leaking out the nose and the infecting organisms, you know, follow that track and get right on into the brain, causing the meningitis. So fever, when we're worried about a basal or skull fracture, does require immediate follow-up because we are worried about that infection. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.